All right, we're back on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. We're joined by former Ohio State running back Maurice Claret. And Maurice, I want to thank you, first of all, for coming in, being so open about your story and sharing your story. Um, we all remember the 30 for 30 on ESPN, which really sort of spotlight, put, put the spotlight on your story and, and everything that you've been through. But for those that haven't seen that, I want to go back and start from the very beginning um, at, at Warren G. Harding High School. You were the offensive player of the year mm -hmm. by the USA Today and an Ohio State commit. What was life like for Maurice Claret, the high school football player? Oh, high school fo football in regards to uh, in, regar in regards to high school football, it was fun. Uh, we had a uh, great coach um, not my last two years. First coach was uh, Gary Barber, and the last two years was uh, Tom McDaniels. I uh, had learned a ton uh, just about the game in my last two years, the last 24 months. And, um, you know, position coaches, Matt Richardson, Dan Reardon, uh, just, just the preparation, the traveling to different camps, the guys I played with, practices being very competitive, and just really preparing for the next level. Just, But overall, it was just fun. We won a bunch. We, we lost uh, to St. Ignatius the round right before um, uh, my senior – I mean, Right before I went to college and, and I kind of spoiled it. I thought we were going to win the championship, yeah. <laughs> uh, but we lost to St. Ignatius. But uh, overall, high school was a, was a phenomenal time. And just like every other kid, you're just happy to go through the high school experience and then eventually go off to college. Were you always bound for Ohio State because of Trestle and the Youngstown tie? Or? Yeah, no, so, so actually I wasn't. I wasn't even uh, recruited by Ohio State. Uh, so Ohio State has signed three running backs. Uh, the year prior to me coming, uh, Lydell Ross, Jaja Riley, and Maurice Hall. And for me, um, I, it just wasn't even a, a possibility of going. And so I really wanted to go to Notre Dame. And Urban Meyer was the offensive coordinator or uh, an offensive assistant at, Ohio, at Notre Dame. And what ended up happening was that Urban Meyer and Bob Davey got fired. So I was already set and slotted, ready to go to Notre Dame. And there was a guy by the name of Rex Hogan, who was like the uh, uh, player personnel guy. And what happened was I was like, hey, man, uh, I had such a good year my junior year that I actually wanted to leave high school early. This is where the whole graduating early thing came from. So I wanted to turn this out, take this out my ear. <laughs> uh, it was bothering me. Um, what actually happened was this. Uh, I was slotted and ready to go to uh, Notre Dame. Um, Rex Hogan had helped me to graduate early. So I wanted to be done after my junior year because I was like, there's nothing else for me to accomplish. I came back in like five games, had like 1,200 yards. Uh, I was squatting like 800 pounds, bench pressing 440, Shoot. hand cleaning 350. I was like a very strong kid. And so I was ready just to move on. And so I didn't have an English credit. And so Rex Hogan, he's with the Jets now. He's the one who said, hey, you have to get your English credit in order for you to graduate. He said, you can't come this year, but you can leave in January. This is where all this January graduating comes from. So then at this point, when they got fired, Urban went to Bowling Green. And so I said, hey, I'm not going to Bowling Green. I don't know where to go. And Trussell was down at Ohio State. So Trussell had came in in the spring, and I was like, hey, uh, I'm going to come to Ohio State. And he kind of just blew it off. But this was going into my senior year. Uh, and so then after, like, the first uh, handful of games, I had a bunch of success my senior year. And they called me back up. I was like, yo, you're serious? I was like, yeah. <laughs> you, know. You, you know, to, to corroborate his story, um, I, his, his head coach, Tom McDaniels, was my head coach. Right. Uh -huh. And we had won a state championship in 1997, 98. and then we won it again in 98. Yep. We played, he probably don't even remember, we played against him and, and Warren Hardy. And so we go up to Warren Hardy, and I was like, you know, I'm looking around, I'm like, hey, who's this kid with this number five jersey? He's a sophomore at the time. Uh -huh. And I remember telling Antonio, we playing defense. We end up winning this game. Yep. And to, we had to get in the playoffs to win. We actually lost to Maslin and Ignatius because – all public schools have time, hard time beating the nation, right? But I said to myself, like, this kid is a monster. Like, this guy, a right, sophomore. he's a sophomore. The next year, Tom McDaniels comes out of retirement because he had retired. Mm -hmm. Tom McDaniels comes out of retirement, goes to Warren Harding, and I had I had saw Ben McDaniels, and I said, hey man, he has that kid um, that from Warren, and he said, yeah, he's gonna. And I knew Tom McDaniels was gonna put him on a program, like running and regimen and all this other and he came back the next year when my, my brother was playing and I think he had like 250 yards in Boston Stadium it was ridiculous no, I, it, I, was, it was crazy no to 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 his point uh Tom McDaniels and Matt Richardson really changed my life and you talk about the impact of coaches and so Tom my junior year set me down and uh he said hey 
uh, you're good, but you're not as good as you can be. And I think for like me, that was like shocking because, you know, when you're good, you don't want somebody to tell you that like you have to improve. Like most people just can't take it. And so I remember he made me read a book. It was a book that Joe Paterno had wrote. Uh, but I think the main point was about preparation and how you prepare for a season. So he would sit me down. And he would break down quarterback film to me as a running back. And he started teaching me concepts in alignment with defense and tendencies and understanding why do we check in and out of plays and why are the first 15 plays scripted. And as a high schooler, I was learning this, right? And so then Matt Richardson, uh, he had basically played for Trussell. He was the one who taught me how to practice. This is how you practice. This is the pace of practice. This is the reason you're out here first. This is the reason that you're first at the average drill. This is the reason why when you break through the line, you run for 60, 70 yards. Were you yards. open to that education? Yeah, so, so um, I was just understanding that it gave me confidence. So, like, when you're younger, you know how to build confidence. Like, you just, you know, you listen to music and guys get hype and they think that's confidence. <laughs> not, that's not like where confidence comes from, right? <laughs> right. Confidence comes from a, a, a ton of preparation, right? And what ended up happening was those guys helping me to practice the games became easier. I could start to feel it. And so Tom and, and Coach Richardson really – Instead of like, just like, hey, man, here's a play on the board. They gave rhyme and reason, and this is why you deadlift. This is why you squat. You hang clean to break tackles. You stiff arm to keep people off your body. You uh, use your arms to keep the blunder to work off your shoulder. When you're lining up, these are the people that you see. This is what cover three is for. This is what cover two. Mm -hmm. This is the corner support. So you start to see stuff, and in high school as a running back, I'm checking in and out of plays. You know what I'm saying? Sure. First half, this is why you run at people. Second half, now you can run away from them because they don't want to tackle you anymore. And so I just understood cool. that you don't have kids my age preparing like this, right? So then when I call Coach Trussell, all of those experiences are, when I say, hey, I'm coming to your school, I'm saying that I can look on TV and see that your guys aren't prepared. You know where I'm coming from? So I can just see, like, you know, like if, if you've been doing journalism forever, if I sit here, just through watching me, you'll say, okay, you, you don't have this, you don't have that. You can just kind of read it. Mm -hmm. So I can see somebody run on TV and just say, okay, I can tell what you have been taught and what you haven't been taught. I can tell if you went on Instagram and see guys doing drills. Ah, that's cool, but you don't understand the game. Like, that's not that's not how you break down the running it's back. It's kind position. of uncommon for for young high school athletes to be that much of a student of the game, yeah. isn't it? But, but just so you can say just um, you become I, – I was interested in learning. You know, it all, it all, like whatever you want to be good at, if you become interested in learning it, is you're going to absorb it. And so I was absorbing all of those teachings, and that's kind of what got me to a different level. That was the reason I said I want to graduate early because the way they had prepared me. And then I was serious about the weight room, and like, you know, you just don't get up and squat a bunch of pounds. There's just a bunch of things that you go through to get to that level. So I was serious, I was focused, um, and I wanted to get ahead. I wanted to go to college. But then eventually, eventually what happened was that uh, we we played Ignatius, uh, we lost. I went down to the All American game down in Texas, and then what ended up happening was I came to Ohio State that uh, January, and that's how I landed Ohio State. Maurice, when you go to you go to Ohio State, we know about what happened on the field. Obviously, uh -huh. you're great. What was that adjustment like for you, from high school to college, as a human being, as a person, adjusting to being in Columbus, living in the dorms, meeting new people? What was that part like for you? Uh, it was actually like it felt like I was moving backwards uh, because I had moved out of my mother's house at 16. So I was living on my own 17, 18. Wow. So going to college and going into a dorm, that was a lot for me because of like having to be like a kid again. Mm -hmm. If that's it, like more so, rules, more, more right. rules, just yeah. just the dorm life. That wasn't good for me. Right. Uh, but uh, like socially, I like I, I just didn't talk to a lot of people like I was like one of those personalities or I still am that. If I'm focused on something or I want to do something, I'm just interested in my work. Like I don't have, I'm not, I'm not real good socially. You know what I'm saying? And not like I'm socially awkward. I'm just not interested in things I'm not interested in. So right. Yeah. So the partying, the hanging, <laughs> like I'm just, man, I want to play football. I want to lift weights and I want to try to achieve something. So and there was I, no partying for you. Yeah, no, not, not at this point. There was right. nothing like, but you the know, stardom came so quick yes. because like, in Ohio, everybody knew who you were. Yeah. But you became a national name early in your freshman season yeah. with some of the things that you did. How were you dealing with that, with the fame of being a, a public person on a national level? Yeah, so, so it was different. And I think it came from the concept. So just think about it. You have to put context around everything. And the biggest thing I can name is that how much uh, culture influenced what I thought I should be doing, right? So uh, I never knew that I would have that success that early. Like, I was confident that I would have some success. But... Like, after the first game, I did, like, 175 yards and four touchdowns, right? 
three touchdowns. So after the game, uh, and I used to be like a hermit, like I would just basically be like focused on doing my work, going back to the door, or going back to the apartment, doing my work, going back to the apartment. So what happened was after the first game, like uh, I remember we went through, um, uh, you, you do your post-game interviews, and then you come back, and then people sit down and talk to you, and then you leave from there, you go off the gate, and then it's all these kids waiting for autographs and stuff. So this is what I believe changed my life in Columbus. After, after that game, I had a bunch of people from my hometown come to the game. Mm -hmm. And they was like, yo, what are you doing after the game? And so I'm thinking to myself, like, going home. But they was like, man, let's go out to the nightclub. So then once I went to the nightclub, then once I pull up to the club, and then you tell the bouncer, oh, this is Maurice Claret we're with, then you go through the back door, and you come, and it's champagne, and it's beer, and everybody's You can see how people look at you. I went from Joe Blow, person playing football, to – I can see when you look at me and think I'm a celebrity, right? Sure. And so wow. then now, uh, I'm not like the ugly guy, but I'm not like the most handsome in the world, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so you know. Come like, on. You know, like, Don't sell yourself short. <laughs> right? I, 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 I'll prepare myself nice before I go out, but I'm not like the main <laughs> attraction, right? But I can see, you know, women who look at you like, oh, you're attractive now. And so all these vain things wow. and, you know, the shallow sex and all this other stuff. You're a kid. You're 18, 19 years old. Like, sounds it, awful. Yeah, it sounds <laughs> awful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when, when you get once when 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 uh, the game changed, like yes. when you got when you Washington State, I remember like it was yesterday. Brett Musburger's calling the game. I'm like, oh yeah, like he, I'm like, man, he got 20. That's 30. By the time he got on Washington State game, I said, oh yeah, this is a uh, he's a made guy in Columbus. He's, mm -hmm. he's that. Well, I mean, but that's and who's ready for that at any nobody. age? But but when you're new to the environment, did you almost resent it? That people looked at you that way, or did no, you just take advantage of no, it and roll with but, it? But I think I think the point I was making was that I was doing what I thought you were supposed to do when you're successful. I'm thinking like you're supposed to have sex with a bunch of women, you're supposed to be that guy, you're supposed to be as important, right? I tell you, like it's, it's uh, for ego and it's euphoric, right? You have a hundred thousand people screaming your name. I don't care when you're 18. There's just a place that you go to mentally to think you own the place. You know what I mean? Uh, when you break tackles and people cheer for you think you own the place B back in the day You was going to Walgreens and Rite Aid and you see your magazine uh, Face with your magazine on it. it. It becomes a part of you You go to class and you know, you're not just a regular student anymore. You're you're the guy You know what I'm saying? So, what kind of guidance if any? What infrastructure was in place at Ohio State for the coaches and mentors so, to sort of deal no, with but, that? So coach, but uh, coach Trussell was there but I didn't care. Like, I was like, yo, like, I'm not here what you're talking about. Like, I'm having sex. I'm having fun. I don't go to class. I, I don't have to do anything. All I have to do is perform on the field. So you sort of lose the, the humility of somebody teaching you. Wow. You know what I'm saying? So he was teaching me and guiding me. Then I got to the point where I had the success that I wanted. And then it, it comes a point, and this is, this is what happens, right? Just like um, LeBron and Cleveland. I could just name that, right? So it comes a point where I do so much on the court that the owner, the owner can't keep me off the court and the fans want me. The fans make the team. You know what I'm saying? Sure. I did so much on the field as an 18-year-old kid that I knew that you can't keep me on the sideline. So right. you, you're holding the business against the coach. Mm -hmm. So where you can't do anything or you can't influence me, and as long as I keep performing, you will put up with all this other stuff that I have going on. And when you're a kid, you just don't think that you're going to – like, you don't think the train's going to stop. You know what I'm saying? Right. I'll keep on playing. They'll keep on uh, putting up with this. And it wasn't like I was doing anything uh, malicious. I just wasn't, like, going to class. Mm -hmm. And and I was just doing the things that I thought, like, when you're a superstar and you can take advantage of the system, that's what I was doing. So, like, that was that's what kept, became a distraction to me. I fell into all the off-the-field stuff. Right? How did your teammates react to that? Was there jealousy? Because at, at Ohio State, it feels like everybody's a star to some degree. You're Ohio State. But everybody's a star here. You were a star here. So how, yeah, how mean, did that go? No, no, because um, I've always been respectful, respectful to my teammates. And when I go out, I was going out with younger guys who came up to end up being stars, and I was inclusive with them. And then for a lot of guys, you know, Ohio State wasn't like this uh, illustrious program like it is now. This was seven and five, eight and eight, you know, like True. Outback Bowl, like Blockbuster Bowl, stuff like that. <laughs> and I'm just being honest with you, you yeah, know, yeah, and yeah. I like, I like, so part you, you'll see me throw a couple of jabs because I never let them forget. Sometimes they'll try to like, I don't forget, like y'all were just mediocre at one point, you know what I mean? And then we came back and we uh, and we we reestablished a brand. So the guys who had and won, they appreciated that we were winning, you know. And the guys who were like, hey, this is my last hoorah. This guy helps us to do it. So with my teammates, 
they love me because I worked hard and I was fearless, right? And so when you're fearless, like you get this spirit that you can arouse in other people, like, man, okay, we can right. go do this. You know, like I, I give you a prime example. We was getting ready to play uh, this to Miami when we were out in Scottsdale. And when I remember seeing them in the mall, and I remember we had a guy, um, and he was like fanboying over him. And I like, he was an older guy. He was like, he was a junior at the time. And I kind of checked him like, and like, forget them. They're the same as us. Yeah. My words are a little bit different, but you can tell, you know, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> respect to me, right? I'm sure they were very different. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but you know, but there was other guys who you'll be younger and guys won't say you influence them that way, but you can see the impact you have on people yeah. where you like, yo, we ready to go and we're in the game. And so guys knew that they can count on me. So I didn't have like this, this internal jealousy. I'm like, if anybody who comes from that team, they'll never say anything bad about me uh, like why I was a teammate because I just, right. you know, I was the first to show up. I was the last to leave. I was always in the weight room. I broke all the records. Um, I was pushing the sleds. I'm, I'm conditioning. I practice real hard. So from an athlete standpoint, uh, from a physical standpoint, I, I handled my business and I was good to the guys around me. My man Dustin Fox texted me. He said, say hello to Maurice. That's my guy. He, he loves you. <laughs> He's a teammate. As you're going through this process and you're doing your thing, uh -huh. you're winning, you, you got – uh, you got all the girls. You you the, you the big man on campus. You doing your thing. If you look back, at what point do you think any addiction settled in, as far as your 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 personality? Right. Um, I'm a person who who has like a like a an addictive person. I'm, I'm either hot or cold. Right. Like mm -hmm. I'm on it. Like if I'm doing it all 100% to do it, I'm doing it. I'm going. Uh, at what point did you do you look back and you say did you have an addiction to the fame, addiction to any sub addiction to alcohol. Do you think any of that set in during that time, those first years at Ohio State? Well, I think that starts in like just falling in love with anything. Well, I think so. I think you're talking about two different things, like being hyper focused and addictive to completing the task of becoming the best football player. I think that started connecting with McDaniels and my high school coaches. The part that I think you're referring to is that uh, if you fast forward the tape, when I get kicked out of school. So when I get kicked out of school and the partying used to be this mechanism of getting girls and hanging out and, and being one of the guys, that shifted from this is my safe haven because I don't want to deal with all of what's going on. You know where I'm coming from? Your escape. Yeah, so, so um, like it's, it's a difference. If I say like, hey man, we just had like a great set and blah, 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 let's go out and party. That's a different mentality going to celebrate hang out and do that rather than man. I'm having a hard day. I don't want to deal with my issues and mm. it's easy for me to smoke. It's easy for me to drink or it's easy for me to pop a pill and I don't have to do it. Right. Mm. But the person that like so that's that's the reasoning behind that. But the personality is that uh, whatever I do, be it good or bad, I, I do it to the fullest. Right. In excess it's, sometimes. In, in, but, but, but with everything, you know yeah. what I'm saying? No, and I think that's people with addictive personalities tend to do things to excess, whether yeah. it is work ethic or any sort of uh, addictions they may have to chemicals or whatever it the is. case may be. Before we move on from your Ohio State, at uh -huh. the end, so your Big Ten freshman of the year, uh -huh. you score the game-winning touchdown and double overtime of the national championship game. Uh -huh. You are literally on cloud nine. But everything's about to come unraveled. Mm -hmm. The following September, uh -huh. before your sophomore season, take us through what happened and how it all came apart. Yeah, so you would have to you would have to end the Ohio State year. So Ohio State was ending, and I ended up um, I ended up having an issue at the national championship with my fr wanting to go home for the flight. funeral. This is where everything starts. Right. To be honest with you, right? Yep. So I wanted to go for home. The, just context. You had a friend that was he, he was shot and killed. He was shot and killed, and and you wanted to go home mm. for the funeral. Yes. And then get back to the national championship game. Yes. Ohio State hadn't been to the championship since '68. And so Ohio State didn't want to be linked with a drug deal going bad and our star players going mm. to funeral or going to this funeral for this murder. And at 18, you just don't have context for like, what do you mean? Y'all came and got me out the ghetto. Y'all know I come from all this stuff. Like, why is it a bad thing now? Like, yeah, this is what I come from. I came from the juvenile system. I came from getting arrested. I, this is part of my life. Like when y'all came and recruited me, like where do you think you came? This is part of the people who I have around me right uh, at this moment in my life. Right. So you fast forward through there um, and we had an interview uh, after this happened. So they, so this happened on a Tuesday or Wednesday. They told me I couldn't go. They told me I could go to the funeral. I didn't go to the funeral. And this is media day. So just put all this to context. And they said, Maurice, like, why, don't, why aren't you happy to be here? 
And I just was like, man, like they don't care about me. Like I want to go to a friend's funeral. The athletic director lied to me. The compliance director lied to me. I didn't understand that I was a, that that was offensive. You have to figure when we talk about culture and context. I come from the hood. If a grown man is a liar, he's a liar. You can just call somebody whenever they are, and you don't have parameters or punishments or you don't understand hierarchy. It's just you didn't want to play their PR game. I didn't even know the PR game. Like you know, what I'm saying? Don't exist like, like, right. you know like yeah. I'm just saying, bro. Like you told me something was going to happen, it didn't happen. You lied to me. I didn't understand all that, and so he had a hard on for me. So we go through the spring. I'm using a car. The car gets broken into. I'm using the car because my transmission went bad in my car. I go get a car from a dealership. The guy, the guy at the dealership had bought a car from the auction. It was a two door money car loan. I go drive. I skip class, drive to work out. I'm working out. The secretary comes and says, who's driving the money car loan outside? I lie to her and say, I don't know. Well, she says, whoever it is, is broken into. And at this point, I said, oh, wow. I didn't say that, but I said, oh, wow. I went out to the car. <laughs> the car is broken into. At this time, you have these real book. You remember those CD cases? Oh, you yeah. You have like three, 400 CDs. This wasn't my stuff. This was stuff that was in the car that they had repossessed from somebody. And somebody stole the speakers out the trunk, and they stole all the oh, items out oh. the car. This wasn't my car. This sure. was a car used from the dealership. So I call Coach Trussell. Coach Trussell says, file a police report. When they come to me and I file a police report, I'm just explaining what was in the car to the officer, right? All this stuff takes in context. So fast forward, right before the season, they say you have an NCAA investigation. I'm thinking to myself, like, big deal, like, no big problem. So when I come to the investigation, oh, let me, let me fast forward, let me rewind a little bit. Prior to, after winning the championship, I was with Jim Brown, Don King, LeBron, uh, Dominic, uh, the, the gym is Dominic Marciano. I always mess her name up. Uh, mm -hmm. And we had a Cleveland Sports Award banquet. Sure. Jim Brown says, hey, if anything ever happens that you get into that you can't figure out, call me. I remember that from the, from the winter, whenever they do these sports award. So I go to this, uh, I go to the, um, I go to the beginning of the, of the NCAA investigation and they're asking, all me, they're asking me all these questions, and obviously I'm just lying just to get through it. And I'm thinking like, oh man, they'll give me like a game or two, like I'll be good. And so I didn't realize whatever they were asking me from eight to 12, they were going to investigate from like 12.30 to like eight. And then they came back the next day and asked me. And they came back the next day and asked me. And that's how the whole thing happened. And so it got to a point they were getting frustrated because I just kept lying to them, right? And so I was like, all right, at some point the school's gonna step in and protect me. So in the process, I said, man, you know what? This thing doesn't seem favorable to me. Let me call Jim Brown and let me call lawyers in like to kind of help me out because like my school isn't protecting me. My school's kind of like feeding me. You weren't me. sure if they were on your side or the NCAA no, it was, side. Wait, it was you clear. didn't have anybody with you at that point? There was no... Uh, the first, at the start of it. That's crazy at, to me. That, the, so the pictures you yeah. see are days after when lawyers came right, in, right, Alan right. Milstein, Scott But in the Schiff. beginning, you were on your own. Yeah, because I didn't take At it that 19, serious. At 19, you were but, 19, right? But you don't take it that serious. But how did the, how did the wow. university let you go into That's that insane. on your own? Ho, 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 ho. Let me tell you this. This is on record. So the university was already being investigated from, from an infraction from Jim O'Brien. Right. So Jim O'Brien and Andy Geiger were real good friends, and he knew that a punishment was coming. So Jim O'Brien had gave $7,500 for a kid to move from Serbia over here. Mm -hmm. He knew that they were basically going to get investigated. You can look all this stuff up. Look at the timeline. Investigate. I don't care what you do. You can't, you, you can't disprove me on this. Jim O'Brien, your friend, you told him to go retire. We'll feed Maurice Claret, who basically told us we were liars. So at this point, you made $88 million in four months. You have the brand back. You have 17 starters. This is my way to give this back to you. Right. And so I just knew it. That's why when the whole Jim Brown thing came in, a Scott Schiff came in, it was like, I thought you were going to help him. Here's another thing. Right. So the NCAA. So do, do, you, do you all know how this works? You have to suggest it. You have to suggest a penalty to them. Right. The university so, does. Yeah. So the NCAA, yeah. like, so you don't, the NCAA doesn't get, they don't give you a penalty. They say, hey, you do a self-assessment. Well, right? you give the recommendation should, and then the NCAA makes a ruling. Yes. So the NCAA was like, yo, we were cool with three games. The school suspended me indefinitely. So they, you feel I'm coming from? I didn't from? realize that. That's and you feel crazy. that was retribution from you going public at the national championship why, game. So why, why, would you, why would you suspend your star player indefinitely? Particularly when. Makes no sense. No. Why? why? Because they're angry. So, so it's angry. But you, it, in your mind, it was retribution. When you yes. were right for in the you first coming place. Out 
publicly. He should have been allowed to go. His friend gets killed. I mean, you so, got. You, you, you so yeah, they miss. I think they would even admit now Jeez. they totally mishandled that. Yeah. So they misread the situation. So you spin this up. So then they say, okay, we're not letting you back at the school. We're not letting you take the classes you take. You have to get a 3.0 GPA. You can't use any of our resources. You can't use any of our tutors. We cut your scholarship check and hope. We'll see you in January. Oh, and you have to do psychological evaluations because you lied to the NCAA. And oh, by the way, that car that you said was broken into of those items I take, you have to say you falsified the police report. I said, I didn't lie. Well, if you want to have a chance to come back, you're going to say it. So the whole thing was to dehumanize you, make you walk into the courtroom, say you lied, get this infraction on you, show you in the courtroom, and just, when you talk about a PR machine, God rest his soul, Steve Snap. But I say, Steve Snap, you see what happened. Sure. These people did. They, they did this on purpose. So just just as much as there's things that I can say, I wish I, I wish I could have done different on their side. I'm pretty sure they wish there was things that he could have done. I different. think starting from the way they handled the funeral. So, so they, they didn't know that it was going to be to them. It was a small thing to you. It was a big thing. And they if, didn't know if, it was going to go public. If, if my uncle died from cancer, they would have had no problem doing that. It was the circumstances. You're coming from. Yeah. No, right. yep, absolutely. But when you have a drug deal going bad, you have to explain this to the world. And so you 18, 19, we, we all could have done stuff different. Like it is so Ohio it. State now is off the table, Ohio, and, and you decide yes. rather than transfer. At the time, and it's still in, in in existence, the NFL. You have to be three years removed from your senior year of high school before yes. you can play. Yes. So you're two years from being eligible. You yes. sue the NFL. Yes. And you win, and Initially. that's overturned yes. in appeals. Yep. So now you have two years to sit around and wait, and that is the two-year period of time where your life really takes a dramatic turn. So, what know, happens next? We talk about purgatory. So the short of it is like initially I was like, okay, I'll get ready to go. So you're naturally thinking like I'll be getting ready and prepare for a workout, right? And so the way Jimmy Sexton, he was the attorney at the time and Jim Brown was talking, they were like, these are labor laws. You'll be allowed to go out here and work out and perform and try out for teams the whole nine. So after they overturned it, I was watching like a volleyball game with Penn State or whoever. When they overturned it, I was like, yo, it's over. Like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm not about to go to Canada for two years, and I'm not about to go to, at this time, it was like... Um, was there a Europe League at the time, maybe? Canada, it was Europe, but it was, it was some other league. But basically, I wasn't about to go play in a secondary league and potentially get hurt when, I think, when I'm thinking like, yo, I'll... I'll so I'll, I'm going to wait two years and then enter the draft. Yes, but I didn't realize that football structured my life up until this point, right? And now that's and gone. so football's gone. There's no interest in school. Now I go right back to the streets, but... When I'm going to these nightclubs and these girls are talking about celebrating and having a good time, it went from there to like, man, I'm here because I have nothing to do. Like, so instead of waking up at 6 in the morning, I'm waking up at 10, 30, 11. And you don't even understand what depression looks like. So you got to figure this is like, people talk about mental health now like it's a normal thing, but this is 2003. You don't like... It wasn't talked about that no, like it is no, now. They thought you were a witch. Especially not for athletes. They did. No, yeah. they did. They looked at you as if you were the problem. Yeah, right. But you just but like active depression people like that's a real thing amongst adults and then I think when you're an athlete you're taught to be like so strong and tough through everything right. that you're like nah I'm cool and nah, I'm all right but no you're really sad you're really lonely you really want to be around your teammates you really need something to do you really need some structure you really need guidance but you know then when you walk out your door you're expected to be the superstar who has it all together so it was like this conflicted space right so now I'm alone all the time now I'm back into the streets and now I'm hustling now I'm just I'm living like I'm on the south side of Youngstown again, right? right? So now I'm drinking, I'm drugging, I'm smoking, I'm partying. So probably two or three times I almost lost my life hustling, right? So at this point, I get on a plane and I go to California. When I'm in California, it was literally just to get away from Ohio. I had no rhyme or reason for being out here. It was to get away from Ohio, and initially it was to hook up with Jim Brown, right? So I called Jim up, like, yo, I like I'm going through some crazy stuff in Ohio. I got to get away from it. Like, let me get to California. Let me land here and do my thing. So when I get to California, even though I was trying to escape where I was at, Jim Brown runs like a tight ship. You know what I'm saying? He had this American program. Very disciplined. These, these guys were meeting at his house every Monday. He had like, like if I would actually body into what he was selling, like mm -hmm. I would have had success. You know what I'm saying? Were but you I just was, not ready? No, Maturity-wise? I'm going to tell you, timing. I get to LA, I go to Sunset. I'm on Hollywood and Vine at the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And so for a week, like Jim was like in Carolina or wherever he was at, and he was gone, and like I had a chance to like experience LA. And I was like, yeah, 
Oh, Bad. Yeah. Go to Jim Brown. Mm-hmm. Or he's the whole time California. <laughs> yeah. Corey, Corey, the whole time that you're going through these two years, yeah. life is going bad, and you're you talked about it getting you know bad habits, drugs, drinking, all this. Be- were there like when you were the stud star at Ohio State, you had all these people that wanted to be around you, all these people, and did everybody go away? Were there, were there people trying to help you during that time, or did everybody just? No, a- after me, I call it what it is. After the suspension, it was over. You they know, were done. They had no yeah, interest in helping. Done. I tell them to their face right now. It hurt for them to say it, but nothing. There, there wasn't no agent who was there. There wasn't a Jim Brown who was there. Well, aside from Jim Brown, after I went to LA, he tried to help. Yeah. Let me let me correct that. But uh, there wasn't a Scott Schiff or Alan Mill. So who Stott, filled that void? The dudes in the street. Yes. You and know, you met up with some characters in LA. Yeah. Get so, into like the. The, the circle you <coughs> fell into and the, the path that led you down is pretty so, dramatic. So it, it wasn't, so I'll, I'll say this, it wasn't all of their fault. I, I'll give you like this. So I landed in LA and we went partying. This is how, this is how, this is how LA all happens. We go out partying, we all having a good time. Who's we? Uh, Anybody we just the girls I'm with. No, just the girls I'm with. Okay. Well, y- y'all would know the girls, but we're not going. Yeah, no, that's cool. Just, <laughs> just the several girls he's with, Jay. <laughs> the entourage. Because there was an entourage <laughs> right. that, that, that came along with no, that L.A. life. No, I'm telling you. Yeah, so we, we were hanging out, and, and, and we were just doing what you do in L.A., right? And so what ended up happening was we went to a party at uh, in Marina Del Rey at a beach, and we were at a beach house. So what ended up happening was uh, we stay in the whole day, and we're partying and having a good time. And, like, um, like we party during the day. And then they was like, yo, let's go out to Hollywood at night. So we go out to Hollywood and we had the table and they was like, yo, let's see if you can bring some girls back to uh, the condo at the um, in Marina Del Rey. So I'm like, cool. So we get some girls, we come back to the party. So after the party's over uh, and the girls who I was with, I end up basically connecting with the guy who owned the house. And so we're sitting there uh, at the end of the night. He just like, yo, like, I don't need, like, he, don't even, he doesn't even understand football. He's like, yo, like, what are you doing out here? Like, what's going on? And so we just start talking. I didn't realize he was under federal investigation at this time, right? Yeah. Oh. So we just, you know, we sitting, hanging, talking, and uh, just doing. Well, he had an ankle monitor on. I didn't realize the severity of all of what he was going through. Right. But it was just two men at the end of the night who just were hanging out. And so I said, I'm in L.A. I used to play football, and I'm giving him like this vague story. But you could tell he just doesn't. You know, he has a. He doesn't even have a fraction. Doesn't know who Maurice Claret like, is. There's people. I don't think people know. Like L.A. is his own. Yeah. Couldn't he, care he, less about sports either. No, L- couldn't, couldn't, couldn't care less about circles. You're right. Yep. Couldn't care less about anything that goes on outside of L.A. County. Yeah. You know yeah, what I'm saying? That's it. Yeah. And so, um, and it's hard for people. It's hard to explain that to people if you've never just been in it. You could be the most famous, everything, and nobody cares, right? right. And so uh, I'm hanging out with him, and what ended up happening, he's like, man, well, won't you just stay out here? And I was like, cool. So we end up staying out there, and I'm kind of teaching him who I am, football and everything else, but I'm living his life just because I'm around him. Now, my you, he lives a totally different life. This is, you go to the garage, there's two Rolls Royces, there's two Bentleys, there's a house in Beverly Hills, there's a house at the cool. beach, there's a house in the valley. A lot of money. These are, you know, this is a traditional Jewish family, there's Shabbat every Friday. It's like a different circle, bro. Mm-hmm. It's like a it's like a completely different circle. Uh, he's up under investigation for organized crime and the RICO Act that he's going to court for. But there was none of that going on. This was just us hanging. And I can see how it comes. Like, he was under federal, federal investigation, so nobody wanted to be around him. I'm suspended from school. Nobody wants to be around me. Mm-hmm. But we found each other in some weird way. Sure. And so we're just rolling with each other every day. And there's there's like there's a lot of wisdom and all this stuff, right? And you can be a guy in, in LA. Just just for context, in LA, you're hanging out all day. Like you can go train in the morning, but you're hanging out at Sunset Plaza or Malibu or whatever for the rest of the day. You're smoking, drinking. It's the culture out there. It's not sure. like it's not looked down upon. Like for somebody to get high in LA at eight in the morning, like who cares? Like this is just what people do, right? So the next thing you know, as we're going through this and time passes, I'm like, oh, I gotta get ready for the combine. But it's not like, that's what I was saying earlier, it's not like I'm training to get ready for a season because I'm going to get drafted. It's like, uh, let me go run some sand dunes, let me go over here uh, to Dorsey High out in uh, uh, Crenshaw or wherever it was, I think, in Compton. I don't know where Dorsey was, right? But I used to drive to Dorsey, work out with Coach C and TJ Hushmanzada mm-hmm. and Ricky Manning and all these guys. I, w- I would train, but at the end of the night, I just wasn't motivated, right? And there's there's something to be said about when you're driving a Rolls Royce already before you earned it, you mm-hmm. lose the luster to want to go get it. When you live inside of a million dollar house at, before you actually earn it, actually you lose something to go and get it. The you edge know what is saying? gone. When you're having sex with beautiful women, 
and football is the like everything I wanted to do through football. I was already living before football. Wow. Yeah. You already so had so the, the motivation was gone, right. but it's hard to explain this at 22 23. So when they say go work at the combine, I'm like, man, this is like work. You feel I'm coming from right? I'm with my main man every day and it's it's we, we're I'm living this. I'm living his lifestyle. But at 22 23, you think it's your lifestyle mm -hmm. because you're doing everything like the guys who hang around the superstars actually have more fun than the superstars. Sure, because they're not buying. They're not picking up the tab and but they don't have to they they they're it's like they, they live a fake lifestyle. You support it. I'm mm. just around you. Sure. I get to live it right. Yeah. And so all the stuff was happening. So then it's time for me to go work out and I'm like, ah, I'll just show up and make it happen. And obviously I didn't make it happen. So I run slow. I'm dropping the ball everywhere. I'm fumbling over my feet. I'm like, man, this and thing. physically you weren't in the shape that you were when you were in Columbus. No, I'm talking about there's no there's no man. Let me go back here. Let me lift every weight. Let me watch every film. Let me squat. Let me lunge. Let me hang clean. Let me get prepared. Let me let me fight him all day in practice like there's even a refinement of practicing hard that you need to do before you get to the NFL. You know what I'm saying? And so all that stuff was basically kind of gone. And so the two years went by. Uh, I was living like this. It was time to basically go play football and I just wasn't prepared. So to make a long story short, I didn't think I was going to get drafted based on my performance prior to the draft uh, at the combine and interviewing and just like it just it just like and it, even I was in a bad place because I was like, I don't want to get drafted in the third round. Like if I actually played, I would be a top five pick. Like I knew myself and just knew the work I put in and where I wanted to be in comparison to where I got drafted. And maybe that was like an immature way of right. doing it. Did you have substance abuse at that time? No, oh, if it was, I didn't, I didn't call it substance abuse in my head. I just but you like, used alcohol as a pretty it, heavy crutch. No, that wasn't even a crutch. It was partying. Yeah. So the whole time in LA, it wasn't like, so just to clear, just to clarify in LA, I was just having a good time. Like I wasn't like, oh, I'm just so mm. depressed. My life is messed up. Right. No, it was like my buddy say, hey, what you doing today? Let's get out in traffic. Let's go to Hollywood. Let's go party all night. So it was like you was winning. Like it was like, yo, I'm with my man. We just hanging out. We doing our thing. But you can label it wrong. So it's like you, you shouldn't be drinking, smoking, and drugging every day. And so, but at the time, it's easy to label it because you're having a lot of success. You didn't think it was a problem. No, because this is just an LA way of life. It's just a culture. It's just what sure. you're doing out here, right? When I go back to the NFL and it's time to live like regular civilian hard worker life. You yeah, know and you weren't ready for that. No, they, they, like Denver drafted me and they thought like they took you third round. They took me third round. Like what, 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 what Denver expected or what I think their expectations was, let's draft him. We th we're not wanting him to play week one, year one, but we have something we can build upon, right? And so I think what, what they didn't really understand was that my mentality had been different, right? So when I'm in L.A., what I'm calling myself is like just a gangster from Youngstown living life. That's how I'm identifying myself. I'm just a dude who from the street football didn't work out. And so I'm just out here with my guy. He's like, he's really, you know, he, he was getting investigated for running the Israeli crime mob, right? So I'm with him. So I'm identifying just, but you know, this, this is my life's so boring. <laughs> <laughs> my life is so You're tedious. You're not alone, Mike. Oh. No, but dude, like, but this is, these are like real stories because like the, the kids you see on TV every day, if you come out the hood, it's either you want to be a super celebrity in sports or who's ever a gangster, you want to emulate that. Yeah. And so at 22, 23, this is what I want to emulate. This is what I think is fascinating. You watch Goodfellas, you watch The Bronx Tales, you watch gangster movies, you watch Scarface. Yeah, it's cool. What, what, this is very Youngstown, too. I'm from but, Youngstown, too. I, I, they they, they look at, like, the Godfather movies as training films. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's true. Exactly. But, so, it, okay, we grew up in Youngstown. Yeah. It's yeah. organized crime. Yeah. Right. right. So when I see somebody up close and personal, you know, I, I can understand what he's being investigated for. I can understand what he's being charged with. And to me, this is fascinating and euphoric, but I'm not looking at myself as Maurice Claret, mm -hmm. who plays football. I'm looking at Maurice Claret from Youngstown being next to him, yep. right? So then when I go to Denver, Denver's getting Maurice Claret from Youngstown. Mm -hmm. You sure I'm coming from? Yeah, Columbus Maurice yes. Claret. No, not like if had I been prepared and refined over that time, maybe that's different. But when it's time to when it's time to come to Denver, they just getting a different person, right? And so to Denver's credit, and I can like, so a lot of times it's just like you, you talk about like the Denver thing just wasn't flushed out. Denver seeing that I was distant. So I would come to practice and I just wouldn't be around people. Mm -hmm. Right. So Jerry Rice locker was right next to mine because at that time he had left the Raiders and was trying to oh, yeah. uh, come around. So he had 19. I had 20. John Lynch was on our team and John Lynch locker was not too far away. So they tried to like create this environment of like people around me. Right. 
And at this time, we had like five running backs in the running back room and Mike Anderson and uh, Quentin Griffin for Rondane. And so guys were trying, but I looked at them and was like, man, like, I'm, I, I, I'm a gangster playing football. Like, it, it's as crazy as it sounds. And I can see it on kids' faces when I look at them. Like, you can see their gestures and before the game, how they look at each other. And I didn't been in different spaces mentally, so I understand how it looks. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I can understand yeah. when somebody thinks who they are. I can look them in their face. And uh, I just understand what type of time they own. And so what ended up happening was uh, Denver was like, yo, like, can you sit down with a psychologist? Like, you've been through a lot. And so what she was telling me was like, you've been through some traumatic situations prior to coming here. Let somebody help you to unravel this. But again, I'm a young dude from the hood. I'm not yeah. about to sit down and talk to nobody right. about my problems. What is this going to help? They're like, I don't understand rhyme or reason. And so like that would happen. And so throughout the entire process, they would just try to coach Tucker. He's, he's coaching with the uh, uh, 49ers still uh, with Shanahan's younger son. So coach Tucker and um, uh, Jerry Rice and John Lynch and, you know, John Lynch would come to practice before practice and do a whole routine. It was like, yo, follow him. And Gary Kubiak was the offensive coordinator. So I would start to get some stuff right on practice squad and you can kind of see it. But then I'd be like, man, and I don't, I'm not sure people don't understand how this works in the NFL. In the NFL, it's not like you get a bunch of reps at practice. Mm -hmm. So in the NFL, you might go to practice and not get in for the whole practice. You know what I'm saying? Right. Wow. So I was like, man, I'm coming to practice. I'm not practicing. I may be on special teams. Like, so just, just like, just, just a whole experience where I was at mentally. I just was like, yo, this is just not where I'm supposed to be. Did you think it was disrespectful the way that they were treating you in practice? Like not giving you the reps? Uh, like, yes, but then I got it because mm -hmm. like, I hated it because I knew if I was like, it's kind of like living in the past in your mind. If I was at Ohio State and I actually played, I wouldn't be getting treated like this. Mm. Like I would yep. be a top five pick. Like I can look at these dudes, there's no offense to them. I can tell that I'm like, man, I'm better than these guys, mm. but you have to put it all together. No matter what you know in here, you still have to put it together to prove it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so then you just have a bunch of stuff. And, and, and I believe like universal, there's like universal laws that govern the world. This is what I believe, right? You didn't you didn't prepare in a way that you were supposed to to steward this opportunity. So it's not going to work out no matter how bad you want it to work mm -hmm. out. Somebody else prepared for this. You're here like short term. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And this this seat is for somebody else. Now, if you get an alignment with what's going on, like you can stay, but this isn't for you. And so Shanahan tried to sit me down. I was like, yo, let's help with you. Ted Sunquist, he was the general manager at the time and they just couldn't get through to me. And so I thought I was depressed before I got there. Leaving there was a bigger depression because I heard on the front side, like, why would they draft him? He's going to fail. Um, like, all this stuff. You hear it, but then you get into the situation where you're actually prof – you're fulfilling the prophecy of other people where you actually fail and yes. do all the stuff where you fail. Getting embarrassed in his room is one thing. Getting embarrassed on that thing is, like, something totally different, right? right? Yep. So did everybody call you a loser, a failure? and everything disrespectful in the book. And then you're like, yo, I got to wear this. And so at that time, I went to California, but I had like a moment where I, I called Coach Trussell up. I was like, yo, bro, I got to change. Like, I just knew, I just knew like LA wasn't for me. And it was like, forget this Rolls Royce, forget this house, forget this environment, forget these parties, forget these women. I remember where I was at, I was on, I was on uh, Hollywood Boulevard and they had a party. And it was just like, I, I can still remember to this day, I was in the far left corner. Uh, and I remember it was Kelly Rowland, Keisha Cole, Brandy, and they had a bunch of people who came and had a party. And I remember being at the party, and I remember smoking, and I knew I should have been high the, the way I was smoking. And I said, man, I'm not even high. I was so, like, depressed. I was mm -hmm. so disconnected mm -hmm. from, like, what was going on. Like, there was nothing I could do. And I was like, man, like, this ain't where I'm supposed to be in life. So I remember going back to, uh, I was living at the, um, at the Renaissance, on, uh, right by the uh, Beverly Center. So I was living at the Renaissance, not the Renaissance, the uh, Palazzo. I was living at the Palazzo. I got up the next day. I called Coach Trussell. I said, yo, bro, I got to come back to Ohio. Like, this ain't working out. You know what I'm saying? Came back to Ohio, met with him, and he kind of gave me some direction and structure. It was like, yo, um, NFL Europe, I guess they used to have a training camp in Orlando in December. He said, man, get prepared for that. Go back to class. Like, get your life going back on the right road. And so he had, like, all the good information, but I'm not going back to school. I don't have the money for that. Uh, I'm not getting ready to um, go get a job because I'm embarrassed. I should be like Maurice Claret, the guy. Right. Like, you know, yep. uh, I can't be seen bagging groceries or whatever. I'm just, mm -hmm. No offense to people who bag groceries, but. but your ego got in the way. Get it. Ego. You know, y'all get it. I'm trying yeah. to give like context. Like yeah. sometimes you can say like a 10 minutes of my 
think it's disrespectful, but it's like respectfully. I just I looked at go ahead. No, no, no. You, yeah. you, you could, I wanted to stop you, you you there because you talked about Jim Trestle. Yeah. Um, during this time period, 2011 ish, a couple of ball players went through the same thing you did. Uh -huh. Terrell Pryor, mm -hmm. um, Boom Heron. Yep. Um, theirs was for a little bit, you know, of, of tattoos. accepting tattoos or, or moving different things. How, how, did you believe that the university could have done something better for those guys? And did you talk to those individuals during that time, or you were just in your in your thing trying to figure out what you was going to do? Oh, I, I got out of prison at that time. Like that's a little bit further down the road, but I, I got out of prison around that time, and I wasn't as um, in tune to the, all the infractions. But at that time, my, my mind was just in a. Mm -hmm. different place. I, I want to go back to before prison because you said huh? you came back to Columbus. So for the second time you were unplugged from an infrastructure uh -huh. first in Columbus. Now the NFL and the party scene in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. Take us through the infamous police chase, <coughs> which ultimately led to but, prison. But there was a robbery before that. There was a robbery. You were out on that. Yes, awaiting then, trial mm -hmm. and take us through what happens then. Yeah, so so in, in a nutshell, um, you stole someone's cell phone on New Year's Eve or something. No, so so essentially I was going out. I mean, I, I've said it before, but I was going out there to rob somebody else and the alley was so dark. It was um, it was like a, it was a dark alley it was it was at the end of the alley. I go to the end of the, end of the in alley Columbus. in Columbus. I go to the end of the alley. I realize it's not them and I just said I'm gonna rob them anyway and I took the cell phone as a point for me to funny so they wouldn't call the police. But as I'm walking back down the alley, the person who owned the club or who owned the bar, they were coming out. This is how I actually got caught. They were coming out and I was friends with her. So I grabbed her and I said, don't go back there. I just robbed those people. She said, oh, that's my sister. Oh, so that's oh, that's how the whole wow. thing happened. So wow. so I took like that. I mean, that's that's literally how the whole thing happens. And then she said, that's my sister. And then in the panic, I got in the car and I rolled off. Then in August, you're waiting so, trial. But but now I'm in a deeper place. Right. right now I'm in like a deeper like I'm about to go to prison for robbery. I don't have anything going on. Maybe around like February, um, February, March is I found out uh, my lady. She pregnant. She's about to have a baby. So just all of like regular life stuff, failure, uh, excuse me, drinking, drugging. I'm just hustling. I'm just doing like basically I'm, I'm in the hood doing what you do when you're in the hood when you don't have anything going on other than what going? year is this? This is 2005, six. 2006. Six. Okay. Yeah, 2006. And so you fast forward and in my mind, I'm like, yo, uh, I was trying to, I don't want to say, I, I was trying to bribe the guy to say, hey, don't go to court on me. Uh, I'll pay you for not witness intimidation, essentially. Yeah, that's that's a more harsh way to say it. <laughs> you sound like the judge. <laughs> no, I, I, I just re Are you? I remember I the case. You the judge. Uh -huh. But <laughs> as you would say, you're about to tell these people you yeah. better not snitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so your car is loaded. Yeah. For bear, and yeah. you do an illegal U-turn and take yeah. it. Yeah, and so I, I, I did, I did, a, I did a legal U-turn. Got off at the wrong exit. U-turn. Police came behind me, and I don't know. It was like an episode of Cops. I remember, like it was funny. It was funny when I was actually doing it, but it's not funny, right? right. <laughs> so I said, I'll pull to the side of the road. He'll get out. He'll walk up on the car, and I'll pull off. And I was like, I seen it on Cops. So like, perfect plans. <laughs> yeah, perfect plans. I got this together. <laughs> <laughs> so what ended up happening was he, he he walked up to the car. He came to the car. He uh he, he got to the door. I pulled off. And so then I get over uh, the bridge, and then I get on the road. And I'm, I'm going as fast as I can. And uh, I always say, like, you know, I was trying to get away in a Honda. You know, Honda is not the getaway car, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> and so I go down and I'm going, I'm headed to a town called Pataskala. And what ended up happening was I made a U turn uh, going towards Pataskala. Then, you know, the police had a spike strips. He threw the spike strips out, uh, busted the tires. And then, you know, in the process of the tires getting busted and all of that going everywhere, police uh, pulled me out the car and, you know, roughed me up. And what you've seen on TV is, um, Actually, me getting thrown in the back of the paddy wagon. That's that was the film they, they had. So, that's that's literally how that point had happened. And with the weapons that you had, there were serious charges. You yeah. go to prison. Take us through that. Yeah. So, um, what, what I think the most important part uh, was the jail part, and this was probably the, really the part that saved my life. Um, so when I go to jail, they they don't allow me to have a bond, uh, which I think ultimately helped me. And uh, the first part of the jail, they mandate that I get a mental health evaluation. And so through the mental health evaluation, this was August, September, 2006, uh, came in, talked to a psychiatrist and eventually got put on uh, medication in 2006. And it was the first time that I was like, yo, this stuff really helped me. 
because it helped me to stabilize my mood, right? So I went from like waking up anxious and um, like mad and worrying and all these emotions that, you know, medication, just like anything else, works, right? That's amazing. Undiagnosed his whole life, been in front of teachers, been in front of coaches. No Nobody thought ever thought about it until he went to prison. And then finally, they're like, we're going to check this guy out. That's yeah. incredible. That's insane. Yeah, so and that's what actually happened, you know. And, uh, and, and How long were you in prison? Uh, the jail part, probably like 30 days. Uh, I would say, what th so th the first part was like 30 days. But right. That, that 23 hour lockdown. So the first seven months mm. I was on a 23 hour lockdown and that's really the foundation of everything. And so just you, you're questioning yourself. You ask yourself, how did I land in this position? Uh, you're getting letters from people like encouraging stuff. And so I knew what I was arrested for, but I'm getting like all these encouraging letters from Ohio state fans. Right. And so I was like, th that was the first time that I looked at Ohio state different. I was like, man, people look at this different than I did. Like I was looking at Ohio state, like a stepping stone. These people were like, uh, my father was alive when we watched the game. That was our last significant moment. Mm -hmm. Like this, you're, you're part of like a family memory. How did that, all that impact you? Just it, like it put, it gave different context around like football. Like this, just, this was bigger than just me getting my family out the hood. Like there's a lot of kids who just say, what university helped me get rich? That's the, that's the thing. What mm -hmm. university will get me to my end destination? The people who went from a university standpoint to get schooled and to have history and tradition and the reason that generations of families go, that is completely different, right? So I'm getting letters from those people talking about what I mean to them. This is also the first time that I pick up a book. I picked up As A Man Think, if it actually got handed to me by James Allen. This is the first time, and I try to press this everywhere I go, this is the first time a book actually told me that you are, what, like basically you, you, are what you, you are what you think about. So as a man think of so shall he become until thought is linked with purpose, nothing intelligent shall ever happen. And it's a small 70 page read, but what the book did was that it makes you have ownership over thought and what you create. Like you create your life by creating your thoughts. And that was like the most impactful thing. So I ended up going to prison. I got sentenced to seven and a half years. And another thing that came into my life, it was a gentleman by the name of Mr. Keller Conte. And Mr. Conte was a uh, warden, and he was from Sierra Leone. Uh, but uh, he said, Maurice, my father used to be the chief of the village. And he said, when you all uh, got in trouble in Sierra Leone, we would bring guys closer to us, figure out what's going on, and send them back out. He said, America, you all throw people away. And he said, I'm about to bring structure here to your life while you're here in prison wow. to assist you. So from there, he put me into a bunch of therapeutic courses. This is what, like, if you want to talk about refining, this is what all happened. So I was in a closed, uh, C-L-O-S-E-D, closed, closed security facility, which means you're locked down for the majority of the day. So you're locked down for 20 hours out the day. So when you're locked down, it's either you're going to the education wing, you're in your housing unit, or you're going to recreation. So the first part of my day, I used to go to the education wing, and I'm taking uh, thinking for a change, responsible adult culture, cage of rage, drug and alcohol abuse, um, and just a host of other classes that basically make you self-reflect on what happened or how you got to this point. And so it was also, I talk about this book, it was a catalog called Bargain Books. It was the first time that I like sat down and read. I used to go to commissary and I would get these uh, legal pads. I would get these yellow legal pads for 69 cent and I would just read books and I say, okay, when I wanted to be a great athlete, I just watch film from great athletes. Okay, what can I do? I'll get out of prison at like 26 or 27. I won't be able to play football anymore uh, from what I've done. Like you need to do something else with your life. So anything I can get my hands on with business and entrepreneurship and finance or investing, I would just literally sit here, uh, order out the uh, catalog. Books was like four or five, six bucks. These are used books and they'll mail them to you. And I would just start reading and I would just start making book reports and I'll start reading from great people and I'll start reading from the men who built America or men who built uh, big companies. I became like religious about reading from Warren Buffett and value investing, Benjamin Graham. And I would just give my understanding on what was going on. So when I would start talking to people, I found like that I used to like to write. That's where I started blogging from because, you know, the more you read, the more you want to write, right? So you start getting sparked inside of your mind. And so I just started loving to write and learning to express myself. And so eventually all these young guys in prison, they start gravitating to me because they're like, yo, like this thing isn't affecting him the way it's affecting me. Like, I feel like I'm wasting my time, but he's getting better. Like our, when I go to wreck, you became I'm, their example. Yes. So that's when I started to realize, like, I have influence over younger guys. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so now you're hosting the classes. Now you're hosting the programs. Now you're like encouraging dudes. Now these guys want to get into confrontation with these guys and guys are respecting like, nah, bro. Like, you know, this ain't 
like go home, go home to your family, like arguing over a microwave or arguing over laundry really ain't worth it. And so you just start to see that people receive you different. Like it went from, is he going to be arrogant to, oh, he's here just to get himself better. You feel what I'm coming from? Mm-hmm. So then I get out of prison in 2010. So when I got out of prison in 2010, you I spent, met Warren Buffett, met Warren Buffett. Yeah. So I, I'll tell you about that in a second. So I go, so the irony of all this is to kind of show you the circle of life. I get out of prison in 2010. I get out on a, on a month, on a Wednesday. I was having a call with a guy uh, named Ted Sunquist, who was the general manager in Denver. He had basically got fired and he went to uh, work in uh, uh, the league called the UFL. He said, Hey Maurice, he was like, I don't know where you at in life, but he said, man, I drafted you and always loved you. He said, would you have time to uh, try out for us in Omaha? but you got a trial Friday. So imagine I'm getting out of prison on a Wednesday wow. Wow. and I'm asking the judge like, hey, I know I just got out, but can I go to play football? You know what I'm <laughs> saying? Right. And, and two states away. Can I go back to the life that yeah. sent me here? <laughs> but you can't, so when you're, on pro, when you're on probation, you can't just, you have to have an interstate compact. So you have to contact their probation office and say, hey, a felon is there. Do you all accept him? Can you review his application? Normally this takes three, four months for them even to do this. They did this in two days, wow. right? So then I go to Omaha and God bless Ted Sunquist, right? I tried out for them, and literally, I knew that I didn't have it. I knew I wasn't good enough, and he was like, yo, I just want to help you. So he gave me a job just to be on the team. Wow. He said, wow. now look, I want you to market for us because people are listening to you, but I just know you're not where you used to be, like, but you can work yourself into it, right? Wow. So, like, it was significant, and so then I'm out here, and it was like other stuff that happened. So when I'm out here working out, and so I, to, to, to that point, when he did that for me, I felt responsible to be the first on the field, to be encouraging, to play special teams. <clears throat> if you need bags picked up, if you need anything done here, I'm your guy for it because I know there's other younger guys who are better than me. I, I just sat in prison for four years, right? <laughs> so next thing you know, uh, the year after, that, the first year to Kyle Janikowski, whatever his name was, he coached for Boston College, Coach Matt Ryan. I remember, I forgot his name, Coach Jay. Uh, but we ended up going to uh, 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 get Coach Moglia. And Coach Moglia, uh, Joe Moglia, he was coaching at Coastal Carolina, but Moglia had uh, been the active CEO for TD Ameritrade then moved on to the chairman. And so he said, hey, man, I want to get back into coaching football. And so he has spent a year at Nebraska being a general uh, RGA, uh, what is it called, graduate assistant. Mm-hmm. And then he said, hey, man, I want to come back to, uh, uh, what is it called, uh, football. So this happened to be the place that he landed. And so from reading about so much investing, I knew what TD Ameritrade was. And I knew exactly who he was. And I you knew did. the significance of him. And the football players had no clue. They just thought this was some dude yeah. who made money. And I said, no. <laughs> like, <laughs> he's we, the guy. He's, he had, he's the engine. He's the guy. He can give you information, so on and so forth. And so I was, like, aggressive about, like, hey, can you teach us? Like, can you teach us about investing? Can you teach us about this? He was like, yo, I'll teach you guys anything I want to. So he used to host these classes. It was, like, mind-blowing to me. You had guys who had been in the NFL, guys like some, some. It was the league where guys who didn't make it to the NFL, they can come to develop. Uh, like my, I played with Michael Wilhoit. Michael Wilhoit was my teammate, right? It was guys who had to develop still, and there was older guys, Jeff Garcia, Amon Green, who were just finishing up, right? And so it was like this mixed breed of guys and coaches who can basically get you where you want to go. So he used to hold these classes every Wednesday, and what ended up happening was, um, what ended up happening was, Joe would show up on Wednesdays, but guys wouldn't show up. And so the two or three guys who showed up was me, a guy by the name of Andrew Brewer, and a guy by the name of Matt Overton. So he said, let me take you all individually and see what's going on. So he took me out to the golf course. I said, bro, I don't play golf. And so we just, <laughs> yeah, so, so he was like, yo, let's, let's sit in the clubhouse. So we sat in the clubhouse. He said, tell me a story. But I told him about my fascination with investing. And this was like greatest part. Well, at this point, it's like one of the good, like greatest moments of my life, right? You see, I'm like smiling. So... He was like, I know Warren Buffett and uh, Bill Gates. And I was like, and I ain't no everyday thing. You know what I'm saying? Right, <laughs> like, right. like, like, you know, like it kind of made me perk up. And he was like, I'll see if he can meet you. And so I'm thinking like, yeah, all right, bro. <laughs> like, you <know> <laughs> like, like, you know, I just, I kind of like, like, yeah, man, like meet you is enough. Like, you know, if it happens, whatever. So what ended up happening was uh, I was walking through my apartment. I had watched uh, Warren Buffett on Charlie Rose a bunch of times in prison, right? So Charlie Rose used to be like my interviewer tonight, whoever he had on TV. And, um, Make a long story short, uh, he calls me, and he was like, hey, can I speak to Maurice? And I knew just from how distinct his voice was, it was Warren Buffett. 
And he said, hey, you know, I talked to Joe. He said, you want to uh, meet up and, you know, uh, uh, I'm down here at the Keyword Building. And I'm like, I'm talking to my lady like, oh, this is Warren Buffett. And she like, like, like Warren Buffett, what are you calling you for? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so uh, he was like, you want to meet up on Saturday? And I'm like, yeah, I got you. Click. And I was like, he was like, no, first of all, he's like, do you have anything going on? And I'm thinking like, if I did, it's canceled. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. More important than hanging out with Warren yeah. Buffett? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing I, I can't clear up. Yeah. So I went down there. And so the, the irony was I wasn't intimidated because I read so much about him. You know what I'm saying? You know, like, just imagine you research somebody you're about to sit down and talk to. Like, I know, I know everything about you, or at least was published, right? So I, I go down to uh, 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 the Keywood building, and what ended up happening was the person who was supposed to meet after me canceled. So he was like, yo, you want to hang out? Like, the person canceled. And I was like, yo, cool. And so we sat down like this for like five hours just wow. talking. But to the point, I felt uncomfortable with him because I'm like, I'm sure you got better stuff to do to hang with me. You know what I'm saying? Right. right. Like I'm 18 months. But he months. took that time for you. That's amazing. Man, five, five hours. But like just 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 everything about his life, like even how his assistant got to him. Like his assistant at the time was like a 26-year-old farm girl uh, who self-educated, taught herself about investing, wrote him a handwritten letter, <coughs> sent it to him and said, well, she think that the value that she can add to their company, he drove out, gave her a project for the summer, hired her, and wow. she's his personal assistant to this day. Wow. Just because she just had the initiative and the ambition yeah. to say, this is how I think that I can help your company. Uh, sitting down with me just was like, just real common sense. And then was like, yo, uh, after after we got done with the meeting, was like, yo, I eat at the, uh, uh, it's either the Huddle House or something every Saturday, like if you want to stop by. Like wow. then I called him like a year later, I was going to the Pistons game to uh, the Pacers and the Knicks were playing. I was off, it was, uh, the Pacers and the Knicks were playing a playoff game. And I called him just out the blue. I was in Ohio and I was like, hey, what's going on? And like had a conversation on the phone and there's never been a reason to call him other than to bug him. But it was cool that like somebody who has this much influence and power uh, sort of going through this. So I was going through all of that prior to the 30 for 30. Mm -hmm. So then the 30 for 30 came around. That's how like me and you connected, reconnected, right? Sure. So then the 30 for 30 became a thing. Um, and I didn't know, like, I didn't know anything about uh, 30 for 30s at this point. I hadn't watched TV in years in prison. Well, cable TV. And then they did a 30 for 30, but the 30 for 30 ultimately changed my life. And so they had captured everything that was going on in my life up until that point. And it originally wasn't supposed to be about uh, me and Coach Trussell. The Trussell thing happens from the thing in Ohio State happens. And Coach Trussell at this time is guarded and doesn't really want to be bothered with anybody. But me and Coach Trussell had reconnected after he had went through that. Like that thing that he went through Ohio State actually made me and him closer. So that entire summer we he were talking. He knew what you went through because it happened to him in a different way. Yeah. And so we're talking again through the whole summer, but it's not like, hey, I hope you get yourself back together. It's just like the changes of life. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so then when I called upon him that August, September, whenever it was, I said, hey, Coach, can you talk to these people? They don't, they're not here to talk about some malicious story. So he's like, yo, I got like 20 minutes for you and we're going to keep it within a certain framework. And what ended up happening was we went to a hotel in Akron and I sat downstairs for like five hours. And so he gave him five hours. So then when the people at ESPN seen the material, they said, this isn't a Maurice Claret story. We want to make this about both of them, right? And so what ended up happening was as much as it's done for me, it's done the same thing for him because they seen him in a different light. It rehabilitated and, both yeah. of your images, both of really. 100%. So... I get done with the story, my fault. Uh, I get done with that story and then they air it and out the blue, I had like, I don't know, 1,100 emails between wow. Facebook and uh, just my regular email address and then that's how this machine sort of started again. Is that what more than anything else changed your life to where you are today? Was yeah. Just sitting down with 30 for 30 and... Yeah, so, I so just, I would have been, I, I would have been one your reputation is, a, is the most important thing. If I could tell anybody else, like if you a POS, like that POS thing will follow you everywhere you go. Um, having people give you a chance to talk to you. What the 30 for 30 did was that I don't have to explain what to Ohio State. If you watched it, you understand it. Now we're just talking like two of human beings. Mm. But what the universe allowed me to do was that the preparation from prison allowed me to carry on intelligent conversation. It allowed me to have like, depth as a, as a human being and so we're just engaging I'm, I was engaging people totally different that sent me out to speak like at this point I didn't even know they paid people to speak at this point right so if you would have said like I'll give you two wood nickels I'm like all right come on let's go yeah, right. you know what I'm saying but that that, that that allowed me to make money and then the money I made from uh speaking 
I parlayed that into building a transportation company. And the transportation yeah. company built me into a treatment centers. Then treatment centers took me to medical centers. You know what I'm saying? So all, if it, Where if, are you today with your businesses? I don't know if it, I don't know, it's like uncomfortable. I know you're. About I know you're humble about this, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. just well, how many bags you getting out of? Yeah, just, just no. You know what? The reason I asked this question and last night when we talked about it on the yeah. phone, he is humble and yeah. and he's modest about this. Yeah. But I'm gonna ask you not to be just for a second. And the yeah. reason I'm gonna see I'll start sweating, because, right? Yeah, they, they say it, all of a sudden, <laughs> you were fun. He was fun talking about prison. <laughs> he's fun talking about this. He's like, yeah. oh, no, my accomplishments. This is, now, this is now like your flex moment. I know you're not gonna take it. I know you're not. But <coughs> the reason it's important, Maurice, because the cherry on your story yeah, is sweating, that but... second chances <laughs> happen. Yeah, no, this is right. my it's favorite redemption story the, I've ever seen. Well, well, no. From the high of the highs to the low of the lows to where you to are today. Well, I think I think. For me, okay. it's speaking to the the young black men out there because they're like you said when you when you come from from where, where you from, you either gonna do something in the streets, mm -hmm. you are gonna be a, a pastor or a preacher, or, yeah. or or you gonna dribble a ball or run a football. Hundred yeah. percent. It shows people that you can make a living out here and you can you can do something besides that because some people only think you That's can true. do certain things. So and where even if life so started off hard. Right or bad, you can bounce back. So where are you now? Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know. I'll go in just an order, right? So I do, we own a very successful uh, mental health and recovery center where we engage with about I don't know about 600 kids in Youngstown on a daily basis, and we work with all their um, uh, psychological, social, and emotional needs. And I'm proud of that. Um, and we, you know, we work with a a handful of not a handful. We work with about like 60 adults in a recovery program that we house and treat and help to get employed and help to stay clean and drug free from any uh, thing that they abuse. And, you know, we have, I don't know, roughly about 70 employees doing that. Um, you know, I own, a, um, I own, a, I own uh, about, I don't know, about 200 units with real estate, single family, multifamily uh, homes. Wow. And we, uh, we do, um, we're, we're the largest foot and ankle group. This is probably, I, could, I hang my hat on this. Uh, we're the largest uh, foot and ankle group, uh, podiatry group in the state of Ohio. And we, we partner with physicians uh, uh, throughout the state and throughout the country uh, with their medical practices, either you know, perched to them in full or per partially perched to them. Uh, that's why I'm in Cleveland so much. We, we, we partner with some great physicians up here that we have and uh, own a few vascular su surgery centers. Mm. And so people who uh, basically are looking to not get their legs amputated we uh, we own a place in Garfield Heights. We own one in Youngstown and uh, one down in Columbus. And so, um, anybody who's looking to stop their legs, prevent it from getting amputated, we help to clean out arteries and help you to stay uh, healthy. But uh, I don't know. I, I'll say this: I have some phenomenal partners. Um, Vladimir Zietzer, who basically introduced me to all this stuff. He's a podiatrist out in California. He's uh, the, the irony of everything. I met him through my friend when I was in California. The friend who I was with, he was a neighbor inside the, like, I just, I got two minutes. You do? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'll, I'll give you this, right? Just um, learning how to be your best self at all times. And I, I'll, I'll say this, right? So the, I'm very proud of what we do with engaging with kids at mental health and addiction services. I'm very proud of what we do with adults, uh, with recovery services. And we have a great team and Dominic Massini, uh, Eric Angaro, Nicolette Bleacher, our whole infrastructure over there. They've been doing that with me for some time. To fast forward now, um, I was in California. This is how I got into buying practices in, um, in, inside of vascular surgery centers, right? So what ended up happening was I was out in LA helping somebody to teach them how to build a recovery center. So they said, hey, we send all of our kids to passages in Malibu. And they was like, how do you build a center? And so they said, hey, there's a house in the neighborhood that we'll buy and turn into one, but could you tell us how to do it? So I was talking to them about building a center. Like this had nothing to do with me trying to get business out here, I was just helping somebody. And I was uh, like displaying my best thinking. Like I think everybody should display their best thinking at all times and just help people without any sort of thing. And so the guy was listening to me. And so I'm not sure who he thought I was prior to talking, but he was listening to me and like, oh, okay. Like this probably wasn't what I expected, like the way I came, right? Sure. And so he was like, hey, like, do you know any diabetics in Ohio? Uh, I was like, yeah. He was like, Ohio has diabetics. And I said, yes. And he was like, uh, who do you know? And I said, he's like, do you know any doctors? And I said, I know a bunch of podiatrists. The irony is that before I came to LA, I just finished talking at a podiatry conference. If you're coming from, so after you're done, people giving you cards, people giving you information. I kept them, so I just knew these guys. 
fast forward, I mean, rewind that part. My daughter, well, this was her spring break. I wanted to go to Florida. She said, no, daddy, let's go to California. So you just think about this stuff. If I don't agree to my daughter, if I'm selfish and I don't and go, go to, to Florida, Cal Florida, this doesn't happen. No, I don't run into, I don't have this conversation. If I don't have this right. conversation, I don't run into him. If I don't run into him, I don't have the, the conversation of being out here. Then I come back to Ohio, a couple more defining moments. So at this time, I'm buying a 30,000 square foot building that I think that I'm about to put more recovery services into. And I'm about to make this hub and do all this other stuff. He came out here. He said, hey, let's partner up. Like, if, show me your physicians that you know. So I went around showing him physicians. We got together. And he's sort of looking at the deal. And he said, hey, man, if you partner with me on this property, I'll partner with you inside these medical services. He didn't know prior to this, I had a 10-year lease that would have guaranteed a sign for this building. So the building would have been leased up. I would have had, like, multi-million dollar property, property worth $3 million is leased up. I can leverage this and go build 50, 60, 70 mm -hmm. million dollars for real estate just off of this. Mm -hmm. But I slowed down and partnered with him mm -hmm. to go build something else. And so then as we're building, this is in the midst of COVID and everything else, we weren't even going to buy practices. We ended up hooking up with somebody else. Watch this. So my tutor from college mm -hmm. kept in touch with me in prison. So I'm gonna tell like this funny story. He kept in touch with me when I, was, when I was in prison. He said, man, we should just tell your story because your story isn't what everybody thinks it is. So he gets back in touch with me. And as we're talking, he said, hey, man, I know you do real estate. I have a friend who does real estate as well. His name is Mike Leach. Mike Leach, my partner, he was the nationwide CFO for the past 20 years. So you want to talk about a machine wow. like mm. I, I got a machine next to me, mm. right? It's amazing. So he says, can you talk to him? So I ended up going to talk to Mike Leach. Me and Mike Leach are talking. I never know who he is at first, but I can tell as we're talking, he's jotting down every note. And I was like, yo, this dude's stealing my stuff. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and so at the end of it, I just started to realize that's just how he works and how he thinks. And then he said, hey, man, uh, I got this guy uh, who's a friend of mine named Brian Inkrot uh, who's talking about buying podiatry practices. So initially, I came to build vascular surgery centers. The first people who see vascular disease are podiatrists. So when he told me that his friend was buying podiatry practices, I said, I need to know, I mean, need to meet this guy. Right. So then from there, what happens was my job was to make sure everybody can play well in the sandbox. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So then I'm just like the glue to the piece oh, of what we're yeah. doing. Mm -hmm. And so then together we start purchasing practices and like, yeah. you know, we have all 30 odd practices right now. And you talk about them. cosmic energy and yeah. it all coming together. That's yeah. the way it was supposed to be. Mike, okay. do we? Let break, just, or do you guys, wanna... let me just say something here, because I think this is really important, Mike. Hold, hold on. Because in a way, your story is extremely unique because of your celebrity and how big you were at, at, at a young age. But I think there's a lot of parts of your story that all of our viewers can relate to, at least yeah. parts of it, right? Whether it's addiction to drugs or alcohol, whether it's um, mental illness, which mm -hmm. especially among men and especially among athletes is very, less taboo now. But there's a, there's a little part of this that I noticed from your whole story that you kept going back to <laughs> so, that really struck me. It's like, and, and on a much lesser degree, like when, when I was 23 years old, I lost a ton of weight. And now when I gain the weight back, every time I try to lose weight, I beat myself up because I was that weight. And it's harder for me to lose it because I'm like, oh, why did I blow it? And a couple of times in your story, you went back and you were like, well, I should have been a higher pick because yeah. I was there. I was at the mountaintop. And I think that's a, see, a little part of this that people can relate to when that success, that great success early almost led to, it sounds crazy, but it almost led to all the bad things that happened because yeah. you were you were constantly frustrated that you couldn't be who you were. So, so to your point, so I was living in the past. Yeah. But what changed? I picked up that book. That book influenced me that a lot. That changed. That got you out of that mode. Because, like, when you think that life is like this series of things happening to you, you don't think that you have any governance or control over yourself. And you start to realize that everybody is where they're at because they thought themselves in that situation. If you haven't progressed, it's because you haven't thought yourself out of that situation. If you haven't accomplished something, it's because of that. Like, that's kind of like how I got out of that moment of, like, living in the past, oh, yeah. like like victim, like Ohio State hurt me, Andy Geiger hurt me, Jim Trussell hurt me, everybody hurts me. And it's really like a passive way, instead of like, take ownership, the circumstances are what they are, let's build it, let me build myself out of this. But also that drives me, like all of that failure, and believe you me, I've heard everything on TV, I've seen everything on TV, 
And I just really think I said, man, when I have, when I finally, I don't know whatever rich is, when I finally make it, I'll say that, right? When I finally make it, I'll feel good like I gave it to somebody. And I remember a few years ago, like I had more money than like I was like, man, I got money. I, I, I don't have to worry about money, right? And I remember saying to myself, like, man, this doesn't feel like I thought it would feel. And that took me out of a shallow place where I thought like I was going to do something to show somebody I had something. And you find a finish line yeah. where you're just like, I made it. But you have made it because look at the influence you can be and are for so many people that have struggled. So, but that, but so you, I, but I think everybody has to go through this. At least I had to yeah. go through it. You have to attain something that you think is important for you to put context around and be like, yo, it's not really mm. that deep, right? Yeah, right? So we had a conversation on the phone last night. I was like, yo, if like, if like, if I can't go do something well and I can't give my all to it and it really can't help anybody, regardless of the money, I don't even want to be involved in it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. And so, like, but then you say to yourself, like, why wasn't I, why couldn't I get there before I had some sort of money? And then you, like, have these conversations with yourself. You say, like, I don't know, I guess these are man conversations. These are life conversations. It's not like this is a Maurice Claret problem. Sure. Because there's somebody out there right now who can't wait to get to some financial destination to prove to somebody or to show somebody. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Reason. Yeah. And then it's you not, get there yeah. and you be like, yo, this ain't really what I thought it was. Yep. I, I'll give you a quick story. I, I was in a transportation business. <clears throat> and I had a bunch of success doing transportation and a bunch of success doing packaging, right? And I made a lot of money. And I remember going to the transportation place, like I was like, yo, like this don't fulfill me. Like putting a box on the truck and moving yeah. a box out just doesn't do nothing for me. Like I, I probably have more fun doing this and laughing and joking than probably do other stuff. And I know how to do the other stuff and it's, fu it's fun to make money, but it's not like the focal point of like why I do everything. Right. But if you rewind to... I'd say more longer than that, probably 15 years ago, if it didn't have a dollar on it, I was like, man, right. I'm not doing this. <laughs> like, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. And I don't what know. Just, change, yeah. But I called that success. Yeah. But then I used to hear, like, it used to sound cheesy when I heard other people talk about it, but, like, it's real. You know, where you just, like, do what makes you happy, do what makes you smile. That's success, happiness. Yeah. And you make it, it, it a difference. It come with a dollar sign yeah. if you're happy. Um, so, quickly, we got a little bit of traffic to take care of. Mike wants you to put your earpiece in because he's got something to say. Oh. While you do that, um... You told me a couple of years ago um, the story when you met Mike Tyson. I think that's a oh, great yes. story. Share that. Then Mikey's going to jump in, and then we're going to take a quick break. But the Tyson story is too good to leave on the table. Yes, I forgot all about that. So I went to uh, – He's had so many experiences he forgot, forgot about, about Mike, Mike Tyson. Tyson, right? I leave with that. I, I mean, that's Warren, my lead. I, Warren Brown right. is the lead. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I was, I was getting ready for my baby shower. Uh, my son was getting ready to be born. And I was getting my phone blown up because I was actually getting dressed. And I thought people were telling me, like, yo, get here. And I'm thinking, like, yo, I have time because I'm going to be on time. And so my phone is blowing up and blowing up and blowing up. And then I answered. And I was like, yo, what's up? And I was like, yo, Mike Tyson want to talk to you. Like, he's standing right here. And it was a bunch of players. So I thought they were joking. And everybody know I love Mike Tyson, right? Yeah. And so I hang up on him. Like, me, I, my phone. Like, get out of here, right? That's <laughs> not Mike Tyson. <laughs> like, this ain't Mike Tyson. Yeah. So what made it believable was they FaceTimed me. So oh, when they FaceTimed me, I picked it up, and he was like, what's up, what's up, what's up? And he was like, what's up, mf -er? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what's up? But I could see he's genuinely happy to see me. And so he's like, man, get your butt down here, blah, 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 blah. I want to see you. So I'm like, surreal moment. Like, Mike Tyson want to see me? Like, this blew my mind, right? Yeah. So I get ready, and now I'm passing my lady up when I'm getting ready to walk out the door. I'm like, yo, I got to go to – a baby shower, but Mike Tyson called me, right? So, <laughs> so like, I, I explained this all to her, like, in, like, yeah. two seconds, right? And so, she like, all right. So, I get in the car, and I'm driving over. So, the, the irony of all this is that Adam Rittenberg is with me from ESPN. Right. So, Adam is there doing a story about something completely different. You can't even make this stuff up. Adam's at my house. I put Adam in the car, and I'm like, yo, we going to see Mike Tyson. Like, turn of <laughs> events, right? He right. thinks he's going to a baby shower, right? So, so we go to... Uh, we get to the hotel, and Mike had just finished up uh, doing, like, an autograph signing. So I go in the room, and the first thing, uh, first thing that get me was I see my man Pete Rose. So Pete Rose right here, you know, he always wear that white hat, right? <laughs> yeah. So I see Pete, and I start smiling because, like, I'm a uh, Pete Rose fan. <laughs> I don't know nothing he did, but I just know Pete Rose, right? <laughs> <laughs> so more hits than anybody in the history of baseball. That's yeah. Okay, I'm like, I just know it's Pete Rose, though, right? Yeah. So I see him, and then I see Mike, and so then I see Mike, he, like, boom, like blow up, like, yo, he come over to me, give me a hug. And he was like, you know, you have no idea. You changed my life. And I'm like, all right, this is getting weird. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, like, like what happened? And so like we get to talking 
And so he like he, he stand across me like man and man, like, but he get like closer up on me. He was like, nah, you changed your life. But he poking me in the chest. He like, nah, you did it. And I was like, yo. And I was like, and I was like, what, what you talking about? So I had him explain it. So at this time, you had like people who were in the room, and um, he was like, man, I was getting ready to have a big orgy. And so you know he canned it, right? Yeah. He was like, I'm in the middle of getting ready to have an orgy. So man, <laughs> this dude has an impeccable memory. Oh my god. So prior to me coming back to Ohio. I was with Prince Marcus from Germany and Mike Tyson at a party. It was called Excalibur after the club. So in LA, you can go to the club, then you will park your car inside of this like fictitious parking lot, and they'll take these they take these fifteen passenger vans to like movie sets. So these movie sets are done at night, and so they rent them out to people mm. to throw after parties. And so you come in, and you would have like all We've these all people. Been yeah. <laughs> so you you know you have these people hanging from the roof, and it's like this whole deal. And he was there, so Mike Tyson is next to me. And uh, the dude, Prince Marcus, was there. Uh, he's and, and he's Josh like a boar son, right? So he's he's talking to me. So Mike's hitting me. I'm like, yo, you got any X? Like, find me some X. So I'm like, all right. You said Mike said, so find me some X. I'm going to find you some. So I'm going around the party trying to find you some. I didn't find him nothing. And I he went back to that moment. He was like, yo, I remember when I see you in L.A. And so I'm thinking to myself, like, that was 2005. <laughs> Like, how do you remember this is 2020? You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, how do you even connect those dots? And he said, when I seen you on TV, he said, if that effort can get his life together, I know I can. So wow. he said it was that wow. moment. So he said, I left the girls in the room. And he said, I really start working on myself. But he said it was that moment. So mind you, he's bawling, crying. And so I'm thinking to myself, like, yo. Wow. Like, it just felt like surreal, uncomfortable. Like, I got to go to bed to a baby shower. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? I ruined like, Mike Tyson's orgy. <laughs> yeah. Adam yeah. from ESPN is sitting there going, what just fell out of the head <laughs> of my lap? He so, wants to go to the orgy. So just imagine the content that he has in front of his face. Boy. Wow. And so he's like, yo. And I'm like, yo. And he was like, man. I don't even know what to say. I can't believe this thing is happening. He don't understand in my head. I'm like, I can't believe it's happening. You know what I'm saying? And so we like, we finished up and I stayed with him for a couple hours. And so then I get to my baby shower, the baby shower almost over. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, but it, it was good. It, it was uh, surreal. In a lot of ways, you guys live parallel lives. Yeah, he was, he was. Fame early. Yeah. Superstars. Oh. It all crashed down, but now you're both in great places. Yeah, but, but I tell you a lot of, I seen him when he did an Oprah interview when I was in prison and just his vulnerability, but I could see how you can live a life where people so like when you're a strong person, you have other strong people that look to you. But what they don't do is they don't come up to you and say you influence them. Like I would never go to somebody stronger who influences me and out the like out of nowhere say that you influence me. And I think like when you see them do different acts, that influences you and encourages your behavior. And so, like, that happened. Like, and, and I see seeing him do that encourage me. Or if I, if somebody who's strong, if they see me, they'll ha it'll have to be like a weird moment where we're not in front of people, they'll say it. And um, he's been like a guiding light for me in a lot of different ways because, like, I can identify, like, once you do four years in prison and you go through that, like, you know, you're in no condition. Like, you, you can sell a seat, you can sell a ticket. You'll have people who know who you are, but you're not the same person. You like, you're not in the gym knocking people out. You're sure. not sparring. You're not running. You're not conditioning. And like, what you even care about after four years in prison becomes, you know, totally different. And and, and the conversations you have and are the aspirations of being great. Or when I got out of prison, it wasn't important to be like some football figure. I was thinking about like, how do I get my life together? But um, I, I'll say this because I said it to somebody on the way up here. Probably one of the one of the greatest moments of my life. Uh, and it doesn't mean nothing to anybody else but me. My brother, he was in the streets his entire life, you know, mixing, moving, hustling. He's the older brother. I'm the youngest. Um, and my brother came to me. He said, man, like, I'm proud of you. You influence me. You encourage me. I don't know if y'all have brothers, like if you have an sure. older brother. Right? You know, the you know? dynamic of having a younger brother, an older brother say that to a younger brother is rare. Yeah, it was surreal, you know, and um, it like that, like I can see why they say when kids don't have parents in their life and they don't encourage them. Like my older brother was sort of like our father to me and my brothers and to have him say that I was like, yo, that, that probably compliment went better than anybody else, mm -hmm. but it encourages the path. Like if that makes sure. any sense. No, but it does. You, I don't know. Mikey, jump in. You had, you wanted some, wanted to say something? Yeah, two things real quick. Maurice, for everyone at the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show, whenever you want to come back on, that chair is all yours. You are more than welcome to come on the panel whenever. It's great honor. He doesn't Unbel offer that to everyone. Yeah, no, he doesn't. First person we've offered that to. Yeah. Here we go. 
Secondly, we do have to take a really quick break. Okay. When we come back quickly, we're doing the weight loss challenge with Gian Bush and, and final Mike Polk <laughs> and his final take. Okay, very good. Uh, before we do all that, I want to give a heartfelt thank you on, on behalf of everybody on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. Absolutely, and Maurice. Good stuff. We, we sat here for an hour and a half, and I could, I could go on forever, but your story is influential. It's powerful. It's motivational. It's everything wrapped up into this unbelievable hour and a half that we got to spend with you. Thanks. Thank you for opening up everything to us, and um, mm. if people watch this, it's memorable for sure. So thank you, Maurice. 